support historically. It's 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 been a little uh, fractionated, and everybody comes from their own isolated position. And I I see huge opportunity to align all the members of the surgical team with better technology, with a variety of uh, software, artificial intelligence, mixed reality solutions. There's a lot of exciting stuff coming. And uh, so with that, you know, I, I really think this is an important group to, to listen to and hear back from as we continue to evolve our products and uh, our solutions for surgical healthcare. And uh, so I thank you all for being here and I'll do the best I can to give you some background, uh, the inspiration, why it all makes sense, why it all came together, how it's all exactly synchronous with my entire life journey. And uh, hopefully by the end of it, it'll make sense and stimulate some ideas. And in the long run, we can all continue to aim towards the same goals, which is to you know, globalize best of class surgical healthcare uh, in every way possible. So it's a daunting task, but it's definitely an achieve achievable task. Uh, can I have the uh, screen uh, share? So, okay, let me see. Can you, can everybody see this? Yes, we can. Yes, yes we can. We can. Okay. Yes, you can see. Okay, perfect. All right. Let me go here back to the beginning. Go here. All right. So, you know, the fundamental starting point of this topic is building the surgical metaverse. And there's a lot of conversation in the media about all of the new technologies and information technologies, whether it's through mixed reality, augmented reality visualization or virtual reality, the difference between the two, um, artificial intelligence, the good and the bad. Uh, there's a lot of fear and a lot of security. We'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. At the end of the day though, I think it represents something bigger than that. I think yeah, there are conversations in industry about digital twins. And to date, nobody's really talked about the value of a visual digital twin in the surgical setting. And the, the solutions that are in development worldwide using this technology are typically about navigation capabilities or putting screws in bone in certain places and seeing x-rays and things like that. Uh, I'll explain how we got to where we are now and, and, and where we're gonna go, but we saw it very differently. And it really came as a result of my neurosurgical career and ultimately my focus on spine surgery. So, with that uh, being said, um, why is this not advancing? Okay, there we go. Um, you know, it was already alluded to. I, I uh, for better or worse, am uh, very much an explorer. Um, I, I like to do a lot of explorational things. I always have. I, you know, my, my lifestyle growing up, um, for a variety of reasons, I had to play sports in order to go to college. That's how I paid for college. It's how I paid for medical school. I played American football in, in college. I can't uh, admit there are people waiting and somehow I can't admit them. Um, can, can somebody uh, let in the people that are coming? Yes, we do that. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're gonna continue to come in. So anyway, uh, in doing that, I've always established myself relative to my own personal stability and growth and, and development in physical stress, physical performance, physical execution. And that's been incredibly important to every aspect of the journey and why at this point, even at 60 years old, I still, live that lifestyle, whether it's in my personal space with my family or in my surgical space where I'm exceptionally purpose-driven and always seeking for better. I'm never of the opinion that me or my environment or my team have all the best tools available to give people their best uh, clinical outcomes. So I'm always striving for more. You know, my original journey wasn't healthcare. Uh, uh, my grandfather was a uh, a military pilot and a test pilot and 
one of the educators to a lot of the original astronauts. And I grew up fantasizing about being an astronaut. And all of my education was built around engineering and ultimately medical and medical science and a little bit of military, which in my mind was going to get me on the space shuttle. But uh, late in that medical school, school journey, the, the space shuttle Challenger had a, had a massive crisis. And it wasn't clear what the shuttle program was going to look like. And I was doing research in neurosurgery and stem cell biology, which I was going to study in zero gravity environments to see how uh, brain cells and spinal cord cells migrate, grow, and organize in zero gravity environments compared to gravitational environments to learn more about the way nerve cells grow. And I was invited to apply for training in neurosurgery. That was a crossroads in my life. And uh, 35 years later, um, you know, I've never looked back. It's been an incredible career. And, uh, it, you know, sometimes life throws you curveballs and you jump. Um, my, the, that chairman who invited me to uh, neurosurgery, his name was Professor Dr. Albert Roden. For anyone who knows much about cranial neurosurgery, he's considered the father of major microneurosurgical anatomy of the brain, and he's developed all of the exquisite uh, data behind every approach, every crevice, every angle of any method for cerebrovascular and skull-based surgery. And in fact, uh, during my training, I, I ended it up with a cerebrovascular and skull-based fellowship and was extremely focused on high-level uh, cranial neurosurgery. And his quote of all time is well known, the brain is the crown jewel of creation and evolution. In, uh, in a strange way, as a big fan of neuroscience, I always extended this as well to artificial intelligence versus biological intelligence. And that's going to have an impact on how we connect the two relative to safety, security, and how we engage. Uh, I do think autonomous AI can be dangerous if um, I, I see it more as a uh, expansion of human intelligence and a way of augmenting our capabilities. And, and, and it, but it has to be like every other incredibly powerful tool that neurosurgeons are very familiar with. We have to learn the tool. We have to learn how to use the tool. We have to learn how to master the tool, but we still guide the tool. The tool doesn't guide us. And, and I am very biased in, in that perspective. Um, Dr. Roden on the left, Dr. Jurgen Harms is considered one of the fathers of major modern spine reconstruction. He was also an inspiration and influence to me out of Germany. And uh, the two of them both made me realize that brain surgery was being done at a certain level with advanced microsurgery and, and incredible attention to detail and accuracy and precision. And uh, yet spinal reconstruction was still done in a very old fashioned, large, disabling, destructive, tissue destructive kind of way. And, and in a lot of ways, it wasn't conducive to functional recovery. And again, with a, a strong bias towards extreme personal physical performance for life, you know, my, my take on spine surgery at that point became one of taking people from a spine health crisis and try to restore them to spine health, health functionality and capability. I never saw it as a disease. I saw it as, as something that happened that best of class surgery could reverse. And that's always been the founding principle of how I've approached spine surgery. Um, the eye mass uh, procedure was a microsurgical uh, front and back reconstructive approach that I started with in 1999 in a, at a time where minimally invasive spine surgery was really only considered uh, a surgery through a tube to take out a herniated disc or to open up the tunnel of the spine. But very few people on the planet had even conceived of least invasive spine surgery at that point. And that's why we've accumulated so many cases because using skull based and cerebrovascular approach principles in cranial neurosurgery and applying them to the spine uh, really immediately gave me opportunity to minimize tissue trauma, muscular trauma, uh, to rethink the philosophy of how we preserve um, all of the functional pieces of the spinal architecture in a way where we could rebuild it without necessarily sacrificing future function. <laughs> that picture on the left here is a uh, uh, a two-level 
front and back spine reconstruction done in 2007. And that included uh, an inner body graft in the front, uh, six screws in the back, and uh, you know, basically in a couple of hours of surgery with minimal blood loss. And you know, here we are in 2023, and it's still considered, you know, next generational kind of surgery, but we've been doing a form of this since the late 90s. So this is kind of an example of how the, the value of that push and the value of always striving for more. You know, I'm a big fan of racing, as mentioned, and, and uh, the racing really was the uh, inspiration and, and the basis, the canvas by which ultimately we came up with solutions for improving surgical healthcare. You know, when you look at Formula One or any advanced motorsports, and you know, obviously that's a very, very privileged sport uh, worldwide, but it's also the most widely watched sport on the planet. So I think it resonates really well. I expect healthcare to work at the same level as F1. And I think it's, it's tragic that it really isn't. And the same attention and resource and expertise and excellence doesn't get applied to surgical healthcare that it does into motorsports. But on the other hand, I saw a huge opportunity to absorb and learn from the best of uh, industry and technology in a way that I could translate back to surgery. And when I uh, jumped into that racing journey with one of my sons, I did it uh, and justified it and rationalized it solely from the perspective that it was going to teach me a lot of things that I could ultimately bring back to surgical healthcare, knowing that I was already chasing these limitless uh, destinations, you know, and then one of the most famous F1 drivers who actually died racing in F1, this is his quote, on a given day, on a given circumstance, you think you have a limit, you go for this limit, you touch this limit, and you think, okay, this is the limit. As soon as you touch this limit, something happens, and you can suddenly go a little bit further. Nothing in my mind on this planet is as applicable to this quote more than surgical health care. So thank you all for your role in continuing to push surgical health care and take care of people, but also to have enough of an open mind to come together and, and learn and message and articulate needs and opportunities for growth and development, because I, I think there isn't enough of that. And we can all, you know, raise the sea, if you will, in surgical health care. And, and this is my standard for raising that sea. Um, you know, in this slide really represents the sudden arrival of a new technology in the in the 20 teens. You know, all of a sudden augmented reality came around and a couple of my partners on the software company we're forming uh, came to me and said, hey, Robert, we've got this amazing new technology. Microsoft has developed this HoloLens One. It allows you to see holograms, but still see real space. And uh, we think there might be applications in healthcare. Will you look at it and see uh, you know, if you, you can help? And at the time, we really hadn't even come close to understanding what problem we would try to tackle with it. It was really just this technology. And uh, so we had a lot of sit downs and a lot of conversations about all the theoretical things that a tech technology like this could do in surgical healthcare. Most of the ideas that were being circulated in industry at, at that point were built around the surgeon, you know, like so many innovation and technology, not the surgical team and not all the team members and not the environment of the sterile field. You know, when you look at the architecture of information technology and healthcare, it's typically a top down model where it starts institutionally and in, in companies and and major organizations, and then it flows down through the facility. But the one place that has always been the limit is the sterile field of the OR, because you obviously can't bring an active data interface into the sterile field, right? Well, when we saw Microsoft had this ability to demonstrate all of these hand prompts to manipulate an infinite database, um, all of a sudden it started to resonate that we might have a tool that potentially we can engage digital information, digital management, and ultimately a digital surgical ecosystem within the sterile field that uh, could be used to the 
benefit of not the surgeon directly, but the surgeon indirectly by means of something far more important and simple that really hasn't evolved in a hundred years. And, uh, you know, so at, at the same time, you know, it, it became obvious regionally, nationally, internationally, globally, surgical care in, at large is, is widely underserved. And, uh, you know, in, uh, surgeries has become increasingly complex. There are more tools, more equipment pieces, more brands than ever. Um, supply is restricted. The way uh, tools and solutions and implant systems are put together isn't well organized and it isn't done in the lean way where distribution is affordable and, and, and available. And, and needless to say, uh, access to care is, is, is not equitable. It's, you know, these are very expensive systems to use. They're expensive systems to transport and nobody's really made any legitimate effort in um, improving the efficiency of all of these things and the simplicity and the leanness. Um, simultaneously into the pandemic, uh, you know, staff turnover, burnout, um, people traveling from facility to facility, the economics of, of staff management have changed. Um, that's in developed countries, needless to say, less developed countries, it's harder than ever. And, and so we just saw a lot of opportunity simultaneous to build a system that could tackle a lot of these problems leading, built around a fundamental problem of disorganization. And the concept of disorganization can really be uh, threatening to people. Everybody personally is going to be defensive of that. No, we're extremely well organized. We, we do everything the best we possibly can. And, and, and that is correct almost always, but that doesn't mean they were given the best tools to be best organized. And, and so we saw an opportunity to bring early 20th century capabilities to the 21st century with some of these tools and in doing so just transcend a whole different level of what it means to be organized. Um, and in general, you know, medical errors are, uh, you know, ex very expensive to, you know, countries, to institutions, to facilities, to teams, uh, shortage of workers, shortage of supplies, everything else. So uh, all in all, uh, I think um, we've really can't, there we go, uh, go out. You know, when you look at data, hospitals are carrying out fewer operations than before the pandemic. In the UK, 7.4 million patients are backed up. Before the pandemic, it was 3.7 to 4 million. Um, we're on waiting lists. Uh, it's, it's double that, and they're not making any dent on this backlog of surgeries. And a lot of it is a direct consequence of surgical discoordination which would help all of these problems. You know, needless to say, the cost of inefficiency and uh, the ripple effect on distribution of supplies, equipment, everything else. So with that being said, you know, this is most people's current method of organization of a surgical field. Uh, a pref card, it can be a, a scribbled one, it can be a digital printout, it can be a 14 page digital map off of a computer, you know, Word document, that lists things, but you know, for anybody who likes to use Google Maps on their cell phone, it's a lot easier to look at a picture that shows you where to go than it is to read a paragraph and try to figure out what it meant while you're doing the driving at the same exact time. Well, guess what? We all do surgery at the same exact time. So it's pretty hard uh, within the sterile field to be um, organizing this type of format. So, and memorization and guesswork, while it gives best of class uh, organization, uh, based on old technology, it certainly is in best of class uh, organization based on what's possible and what's used every day in other industries. So we see this as a, an incredible opportunity to streamline teams, to superpower scrub techs, superpower circulating nurses, to improve inventory control, revenue management, billing, uh, acquisition, SPD, tray organization and setup the number of trays that are required for any given case, consumable management, waste of consumables, um, you know, accounting of inventory for implants. All of these things are stressed because of old and ancient methods of accounting and, and ledger. So, so with all of this being said, uh, this was one of the pictures off of 
your social media feed in Torg that led to our first conversation. So I saw this and I was like, oh, this is an amazing example of the burden that a surgical team has when they know that a surgeon with this kind of a case walks into a room and expects everything to be relatively available for them to execute this unbelievably complicated surgery. So, you know, I saw this picture and that's when I honestly reached out and, and started the conversation. And ultimately it's the reason why I'm talking to you about all of this stuff today, but it's an incredibly extraordinary task for some person or team of persons to, you know, deftly and efficiently and quickly organize something as complex as this. And, and, and it's amazing how well it's done considering the lack of organizational tools and principles that we start with. But on the, by the same token, it was a challenge to us, given what we were trying to build and what we were inspired by, to come up with a methodology that could help streamline these problems and make it flow better. And uh, even within the setup, you can literally stare at this and see phases of a case and, and, and a reference guide for how a case will flow and what you have first and what you need second and what you need third. And, and, and if you have multiple teams during one case, how different teams have different organizational profiles. And you can see this in this picture, but it's extremely hard to organize if you're a surgical team member who's never worked in this particular environment on this particular procedure with that team. And consequently, education is is, is much more difficult than it should be. You know, we talk about the racing. Uh, this slide is just simply a reminder. This is what I had the privilege of racing in two different rocks, of course. And uh, that's me in the Rolex 24 in 2019, where, where we uh, had the privilege of succeeding at a high level in that race. But this inspired all of the uh, subsequent production of um, our software applications. So this is an Escher print, sort of. It, it was an artificial intelligence rendition of an Escher print. Uh, I've always thought in flow forward, relentless downhill flow forward, always forward. And so we, uh, we taught uh, ChatGPT how to do a surgical OR that's always moving forward with throughput and with follow through and without roadblocks and without structure. And it became sort of this, this uh, metaphor for what, how we wanted to uh, tackle the problem of disorganization in, in uh, surgical healthcare. So the initial mock-ups and when we finally realized the problem we wanted to solve were that we'll use a software to create a visual metaverse, a visual surgical environment of all the tools, all the equipment, all the consumables, build out reference guides, build out sequences, build out the ability for surgical teams in action on the field in surgery to have immediate awareness, not only of what they're doing in real time, what systems they're using, uh, technique guides for systems, but also what they're about to do. And if, if team members come and go, the next team member will know exactly where in a case they are and what the organizational map looks like at that moment in the case. And we were gonna use this to help conjure up the uh, architecture for the software, because ultimately it's still just software. The difference is instead of making lists and writing paragraphs with software, we're, we're creating holographic visual images that are transposed into a real environment where the team has immediate awareness of where things go, what the orientation of the room is, where's anesthesia, where's the microscope, where's the x-ray machine, where is cell saver, where is the back table, the Mayo stand, what's on the Mayo stand, what is the organization of the back table, immediate visual cues that make it absolutely effortless to be maximally well organized and reduce the burden of starting new cases, preparing for new cases. Our goal isn't to make surgery faster, it's to eliminate waste of time and resource in surgery because of the chaos of the, of the, the build up and the origination and the organization and, and the, the management of all the tools and things that we need to, to prepare for. So with that, you know, we, we definitely have the feeling that artificial intelligence can optimize certain steps. And the way I wanna use artificial intelligence is not as uh, 
playing doctor or replacing staff or, or jeopardizing staff. On the contrary, we want to use it to superpower staff and make them more aware and, and, and faster and better capable to not only execute their job, but do it in a less stressful environment, in a more potent and powerful environment. And mixed reality, it's, it's not about the fancy device. It's about being able to transpose uh, visual software uh, expression in a way that teams can use it to immediately negotiate complex surgical tasks and procedures. And uh, with this kind of power, we definitely feel like um, we can improve the flow, the availability, the, the overall throughput of, of surgical performance. You know, so ultimately creating a safe AI that builds on a database of tools and steps and best practices. Imagine a world where operative descriptions can be fed into an AI, which immediately creates a flow of, of written surgical steps where you can isolate tools and consumables and, and implants to various phases of the case on the, on the surgical field, in the sterile field, in real time. Ultimately, being able to analyze it and look back at the data and, and learn best practices and then use that as a perpetual optimization machine to improve best practices. The ultimate goal of all of this, and it's a little daunting at first expression because who's gonna get it? it there's no question as it starts, it's gonna start in the more uh, developed environments, but the goal is to expand capability and use ultimately worldwide and uh, improve surgical flow throughput, supply, education and capability uh, in, in, in an environment where all of these resources are progressively declining, not increasing. Um, gathering real-time data ultimately feeds back to the beta database. We're as good as the data. So, you know, I, I think when you're talking about clinical diagnostics in AI, it gets a lot more complicated. When you're talking about organization of tools and surgery, it's much more analogous to how these technologies have been used in automotive and aviation and, and uh, industry and warehousing and logistics. And so we see a direct and immediate parallel to surgical healthcare that really is lacking. Um, you know, this is a perfect example of, okay, how, do you, how does this surgeon want his Mayo stand organized? How, what tool is next on the list? What is he about to need when he puts his hand out? All things that are designed to superpower the scrub tech and make them really, really have an immediate opportunity to know exactly what's about to happen. You know, the reference guide, we're at the micro decompression, we're talking about bone work. We have holographic screens that reflect the micro microscopy uh, digital monitor and not, you know, by rotating your head 180 degrees backwards while you're trying to work forwards, but you can put it right in front of you, right next to the, the area where the surgeon is working or where the assistant is working. All of these things are possible right now, and it's just a matter of growth and expansion and development. And so, you know, this particular group and the diversity of this group really gives us the opportunity, one, to listen, two, to, to uh, project, and three, ultimately to, you know, self-inspire so that we can stay on the right course and we can continue to build all of the, these ideals, which are so important to ultimately improve the surgical healthcare environment. You know, this is a general reflection of what we're doing, a web portal which builds a holographic digital preference card, artificial intelligence to optimize procedural steps, an iOS tablet so that the circulating nurse can be a big part of the data capture and have an interface by which uh, he or she can, you know, engage that surgical field with the scrub tech who's managing a mixed reality environment where they're creating moments and opportunities uh, with consumables and implants and tools and systems on the field. And that, that circulating nurse is back and forth uh, in a digital format, something previously impossible. Now, data processing to learn from the experience and ultimately continue to improve the library and then cycle repeat, always forward. Uh, ultimately, optimize organization, maximize efficiency, increased workflow, less medical errors are all the goal. Superpowering teams is a foundational goal. All of this is really just an extension of our desire to always improve surgical implants, surgical procedures, surgical set design, 
taking a 22 tray system down to one tray. That improves SPD management. It improves throughput of tools and equipment. All of these things, again, we have singular goal, improve access to care, uh, streamlining efficiency of care, affordability of care, ultimately globalization of care. Um, you know, this is an example of the point of view of our product right now. And uh, this is a seen through the eyes of my surgical tech through their HoloLens. You know, back to Dr. Roden, his most famous quote in neurosurgery circles is there is no finish line. This ties in brilliantly to uh, uh, Erdin Senna's um, quote that I showed earlier about limitless. There is no limit. Once you get to a limit, you, you see a new limit. Um, passionately, I believe that we're all on a journey in surgical health care where we have substantial opportunity to continue to not only improve execution and organization, but also delivery of care in surgical health care. And these are the things that my lifetime is, is pledged towards. It's what I'm going to do until I can no longer. Um, and uh, I thank you for all allowing me to share this with you and uh, share some of my feelings and, and philosophies and inspiration. Uh, I, I see this group as having a big role in uh, spreading the, the message uh, of, of possibilities in surgical healthcare because a grassroots kind of projection forward is really the only way that as a group of humans, we can all come together to push boundaries because right now I think healthcare is too secular. It's too disconnected. Doctors don't communicate with nurses who don't communicate with technicians who don't communicate with institutional administrators and bureaucrats. And we really have to do this as a team. And I you know 